Once you start using scales in your classroom, you'll notice they significantly change your grading mindset. Traditional grading is based on quantity, which is you give a test with a bunch of different go learning goals, a bunch of different skills. This is an example of a language arts test for second graders. You're going to have questions about vocabulary, comprehension, maybe the story structure, um, answering questions. A lot of different skills are usually mixed into these traditional tests and students get a grade based on the quantity they get right, so their percentage. When you start working with a scale, you're going to notice they're about the quality of understanding. So you're focusing on one learning goal at a time. Here's another second grade example. I can ask and answer important questions to show I understand what I'm reading. Here are some of the important questions. Who, what, why, where, when, how. The scale shows that a student at level three would be totally proficient at doing this themselves and they'd be able to ask questions that are pertinent to understanding the story. Level two, I can ask and answer some questions by myself. They might need to reread. Some of their questions might not be totally relevant. Things like that. They're going to have a lower quality of proficiency with this scale. Level one, they're your kids that need a lot of extra support. And level four, these are your kids who could probably teach the class how to do this, who would have an in-depth understanding and maybe even be able to analyze like what questions are the best questions. Um, to understand the story or to answer certain questions that are asked to them. So each level of your scale shows a different quality of understanding. And this gets translated for a lot of teachers into percentages and the scale can get confusing at that point. So let's look at a couple of examples of how to do that because usually even if you're assessing students based on the quality of their understanding, you still have to turn that into percentage for your report cards. So let's see how that's done. The first thing to consider is the meaning of each level of your scale. So in the art and science of teaching, I was introduced to this in 2010 through my school district. We were required to start using these and creating these. Uh, we all struggled a little bit to figure out how that, what that would look like and how we would put this together, but over time I kind of figured out a simple pattern. Level three again, score three, is your grade level expectation. So whatever content standard you have, level three would be no major errors or omissions regarding the information and processes. That means they have the knowledge and they can use it in whatever way they're required to at that grade level. So score three is the grade level expectation. Score two is having some minor errors, maybe missing some details, maybe forgetting a few things, maybe needing a little support, but they're mostly getting it. That's where most of your students are gonna probably come in. Level one, these are your kids that need a lot more support. A score of zero would be someone with some serious learning disabilities or maybe some serious behavioral challenges. Your score four is about in-depth and applications. So students take the grade level information and they do more with it. Again, sometimes that's required by school districts and sometimes it's not. Once you understand the meaning for each level of the scale, it's a little easier to think about relating that to a traditional grading scale. Let's look at one. How do we make this transition from percentages to scales? Um, in Marzano's book, Formative Assessment and Standards-Based Grading, he offers several different approaches for how to grade, how to create assessments, how to assess assessments over time, um, whether you're blending many standards together for one subject, like all your math standards for the quarter, or whether you're just looking at growth over time for each objective. This is what I found simplest. Teachers first translate scores on the scale to percentage scores, then average the percentages. That's pretty much what we're used to doing already, so it's easiest to understand. If you look at the grading scale I have at the right, this is what my district used, and it's suggestive, so you'll notice a couple of the scales overlap, and that's because every district, every school, has some flexibility to decide how they want to approach this with the understanding that you know what each level means. Level three 
is always grade level. Two is most of your students working toward grade level mastery. One is your kids far below. Four is your kids who are advanced. Now, when it comes to things like work quality, turning assignments in on time, I worked with gifted and high achieving students for a long time. I also worked with reading intervention students, the whole spectrum, and kind of got to see a lot of the patterns and tendencies. And um, my gifted kids were not always the ones getting 100%. So if you look at this scale and you think of it as an endpoint, well, 4.0, you have to have 100%. You're going to have very few students reaching that 4.0 level. And really what the 4.0 means is a range, not an endpoint. It's a range of students who have mastered grade level content and are ready to work above. And that could be anywhere from probably 90, 95 to 100%. So here in the image, 4.0 would be a range between about 95% and 100 because you definitely want to catch your highest level students who have securely mastered grade level content before giving them extra challenges. So usually they're performing really well. Your three and a half, those are students who have passed grade level skills. So they're in that three, level three range, but they're on the higher end. So they've more securely passed it. And Marzano suggests using half scales as well, just to have more flexibility in your grading. So you can see how the 3.0, 3.5, and 4.0 could potentially be broken up into those five and five percentiles, all of those being A's. Right, because if you a student actually passes grade level skills, getting an A is fair. Getting a B could also be fair. Maybe they're on the lower end. Maybe they kind of just barely pass the grade level skills. They're not a 3.5. They're more like a 3.0. That could definitely be a B student. Now, anyone who's still in the level 2 range, they're still working toward grade level mastery. They're not there yet. So if you think about traditional interpretations of a C, or the C percentiles between 70 and 80 percent. Yeah, that's what that means. You're not quite there yet, but you're close. So maybe you're good enough. Maybe it's one subject that's not your strength. You're doing fine and everything else. But C means you're not quite there yet. So maybe two and a half, maybe two. D and E, those are on the lower end of the scale. That's your low twos and your ones, your students who are really struggling. You're going to notice 50th percentile is the very bottom of the scale. There's a reason for this. We're going to take a look at that on the next slide. Deciding on your scale. So things to consider. I already mentioned kind of the traditional meanings of A, B, C, and D. The traditional understandings of the percentiles that go along with A, B, C, and D. And understanding the meaning of each level of the scale. So I hope this has given you some helpful things to consider as you solidify your grading scale, understand the meanings of each level, and start applying it to your own assessments. If you'd like any more help or examples, please visit my website, mrsleslevellearning.com. I have proficiency scales, portfolios, and assessments already made for grades 1 through 8 in math and language arts. Um, new things coming out all the time and I definitely love to get feedback and hear how it's working for people in your classroom. Um, feel free to leave any comments or feedback and thank you for your time.